So with that, I'll turn it over to Nelia. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming today and taking time out. I mean, I know the lunch is fabulous and we'd love to feed you, but this information will carry you in the coming semesters and really will help you kind of think about how you make choices in terms of your courses, uh, think about the process, why we do the things the, the way we do it at Georgetown. Andrea was fabulous and came up with the title about the Hitchhiker's Guide to Pre-Registration. It truly is. You're going to learn a lot that you want to know, you need to know, and maybe some stuff you don't want to know. And we'll throw a little advice in along the way, and I'll make sure that there's enough time to ask questions. And because we're such a small group today, we can really drill down and go to some pretty specific questions if you have them. But let's kind of get ourselves started. So. Before you start the pre-registration process, all of you know that the online schedule is available. And so there are some really helpful resources that you can start accessing. One is, of course, the online schedule. Once we can get the internet up at Georgetown, you might actually be able to start looking at it today some more. We've posted on the SSP site the SSP master course list. What's that? That's the replacement for what used to be the pre-approved course list that we would do semester to semester. The thing that we struggled with was to try and get something that was truly accurate and useful done in as quick a time as possible so that you all could access it. The master course list has all of the courses that we have taught are active within the past couple of years. The list is split into two sections. The first is in numerical order, so it goes from 500 all the way down to 710. The back half of the list separates out the courses by concentration so you can see both. Does it mean a little extra late work for you all? Yes, because you have to go and look at the fall schedule, see what's being taught. But we do give you some hints like what's traditionally taught in a fall semester, what's traditionally taught in a spring semester, what's taught in both, and there are some summer courses in there as well. The other thing to look at, and this is a pretty recent document, is the fall 2016 approved external course list. That is the list of courses that are for programs other than SSP, MSFS. INAF, uh, public policy, government, that are already approved by Dr. McNower and have designations. That course is broken up by concentration and you can check there. A note for those of you who actually like to kind of troll the schedule, occasionally I do, uh, not everyone does. If you find a course that's not on that external course list, because I look but I can't catch everything, you can go through the course approval process. We have directions on the website, a form that you have to fill out. Please don't send an email to me and ask, hey, Nelia, do you think that this can count for X? I have nothing to do with the process other than on the back end. Go through the request process with Dr. McNower, and we'll talk about the timing of it in terms of pre-registration as we go through and talk about how you go through the actual pre-registration steps. The important thing to remember right now Please check your student account through My Access. You need to make sure that there are no holds on your account. Holds can be put on as late as 5 o'clock tomorrow. So it's worth going in, just checking to make sure that you don't have any holds. They could be for financial holds. If you have, oh, the university, anything more than about $100, you'll have a hold on your account. If you needed to turn in immunization forms, this is the time when that will come into play. So go ahead and check to make sure that you don't have a hold. If you have a hold, you can actually go through and submit your courses. The place where you'll get hung up is when the registrar actually goes through the process and runs the pre-registration algorithm. That's what will keep you from getting courses assigned. So for the fall 2016 semester, let's talk about kind of new and old and what's coming up. We have seven brand new SSP courses which were listed in this week's weekly brief. So uh, the politics of U.S. national security with Professor Fontaine, the role of development in U.S. national security with Professor Foley. He's coming from USAID and does a lot of development work in Afghanistan. Um, and I'm trying to think of where else in the region, but he's excited to be able to come and teach this course, and we kind of snagged him away from MSFS. And Professor Fontaine's taught here in the past, in the past, but he's the president of the Center for New American Security. Uh, domestic terrorism with Professor Hewitt, 
uh, Cyber Conflict and Policy Dilemmas with Professor Tomes. Many of you will recognize Professor Tomes' name from 501. Um, readiness, Strategic Choices, and Emerging Threats with Professor Jones. Professor Jones actually teaches a national security course during the summer, and he's actually been able to develop this course for us for the fall semester. Maritime Conflict in Asia with Professor Cole. Uh, Dave, I know that you had sent out some information about Professor Cole. Yeah, we put a, uh, on the weekly brief uh, was an interview. He's, he is uh, now Professor Emeritus from the National War College. He just retired, and he is uh, an expert on China, uh, military is a retired Navy captain, taught at the National War College for 20 years, taught me, he's one of my mentors, and uh, and so he's going to be teaching uh, maritime conflict in, in Asia. He knows China inside and out, and uh, the interview that he just did, and we posted the link in the weekly brief this week, uh, is really uh, really worth uh, worth reading. He has got some uh, uh, very important views on, on China that I think you'll really, uh, you'll really benefit from. The final new course is the Individual in Society and Human Security with Professor Singh. I know that there's been a lot of interest kind of back and forth about more human security courses, so we're trying to kind of pick things up with that course. Note that with these seven courses, for example, if you had a new professor or a new course this semester, you got uh, an initial course survey. We'll do that again for all of these seven courses when they start in the fall semester. Professor Singh is, uh, uh, of course, she's from India, but from uh, Vancouver, uh, educated in uh, um, in uh, England and many years uh, working with the UN and, and non-governmental organizations. So we're going to have two existing SSP courses just taught by different faculty. Uh, Security Issues in South Asia with Professor Lynch, that's uh, Dr. Fair's course uh, that's being taught this semester and also the prior fall, and China and its military with Professor Harold. Professor Harold is um, an Asia expert, has done 710 for us, teaches security in East Asia during the summer. Um, I will tell you that from working with him again on the administrative side, he is fabulous, and that generally says if he's easy to work with on the administrative side, he's great in the classroom, and he's excited to come in and continue this course and for us. Professor Lynch is a distinguished research fellow at the National Defense University, uh, part of General Petraeus's brain trust on, on South Asia, um, and uh, uh, worked uh, worked for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, and, uh, and is really a South Asia expert uh, uh, for for many many years. So let's talk a little bit about pre-registration background. I mean, this is no joke. It, it has been around since the dinosaurs have roamed Red Square and they walked past the trees by ICC. But also, if you think about it, it's been here since someone you know went to school here. So if you know, that's the front of Healy. And no joke, this is the spring, and this was right after I submitted my Scantron form when I used my little pencil to put in my pre-registration requests. So, been there, done that. Been there, done it, understand the process, and I've been involved with the way the university has done this for way longer than you want to know. I won't even tell you what year that is. But don't, that was a fabulous dress, though, I will tell you about it. Um, so, just continuing the background, the process itself actually really works for Georgetown as an institution. If you've sat down and met with me or with Bree, with Andrea, with Jessica, with Dave, you know that Georgetown is really involved in kind of the, the equity and the fairness and having a student really have a great individual experience here at Georgetown. And we have found that there's not really a live system that meets who we are as an institution. So. It's really working for Georgetown because it's just the most equitable way that we know of to assign seats and courses. It is definitely not a live process, so you don't, for those of you who remember registering the first time around and you had to jump on at a certain time, that's not what this is. You get to sit down, fuzzy slippers, cup of coffee, whatever you want to do, after you watch some TV, read something, that's when you can do it. You don't have to be on right away the first day. Pre-registration does run from April 4th through April 16th. It's a 12-day window. You can take your time, you can ponder, you can save, you can submit it right away if you want to. I don't care how you do it, just make sure you get everything in, this, in by the 16th and we'll talk about the importance of that deadline coming up. You all should have received an email from the registrar's office with pre-registration details dates and kind of other important information, things, again, stuff that I've already said, check your account for holds, you know, look at the course schedule, talk to your advisors about what courses you should take to make sure that you are on track for graduation. Like every other student process pretty much here at the university, this will all go through my access. 
So it's important to kind of pay attention to the different pieces and follow the process. Before you start actually sitting down in my access and putting things in, come up with a list of courses that you're interested in. For full-time students, have a list of about four to six courses and you'll pre-register for, you'll submit probably three or four course requests. For part-time students, have a list of about two to four courses. Again, you'll submit requests for about two to three courses, kind of depending on, on the popularity of certain things. Um, when you go into My Access and you're ready and you have that list, you'll click on the Student tab, and then there's the little registration block. And it's important that you select pre-registration. Don't go to the registration block that has like wait list, course, add, that kind of stuff. That won't be active yet. The tab that will be active will be pre-registration. When you get in, you'll be presented with two columns for entering your course requests. The first column will be for your primary requests. The second column will be for your alternate requests. So now that you've seen all this and you see how it works, now it's time to prioritize your requests. And like, how do you actually do that? And you probably, hopefully if you've read through the registrar's email and tried to follow what it says, it'll tell you primary requests and respective alternates should be aligned together and they receive the same priority. All primary requests are processed first and then alternate requests, primary requests fail. All priorities are scheduled first. Like, oh my God, what does that mean? It's like a whole bunch of words and gobbledygook. Here's how the system really works so that you know in plain English. The system will read your first primary course request. If you get your first primary course request, so if you get a seat in that class once the red algorithm is run, the system will skip down, uh, will skip past your first alternate request and will move down to your second primary request. Are you with me so far? Okay. If you do not get your first primary request, the system will skip over and it will read your first alternate request. So instead, it will go from first primary to first alternate. And it gives your first alternate the same weight as your first primary request. Makes sense? So if you request a course, it's full by the time it gets to you. It will skip over to your first alternate and give it the same priority as your first primary request. The system then follows that same pattern all the way down through all of your requests. And it works when you look at it kind of like a broken, weird zigzag. So what does this look like in terms of sample course requests for a fall schedule? So we'll just pretend this is what I am thinking about for the fall semester. I'm interested in economics of substate violence, hands-on unconventional technologies, Russian national security, and just as a fourth course to have security in South Asia. I've put in the course numbers, I have those available, helpful to have as you're going through the process, and also the CRN, which are the five digit course numbers, those are the easiest things to plug into my access instead of trying to use the search feature. So what would this look like if I were to do the requests? So. In the two columns, I have the primary requests and your alternate requests. I know, as many of you know, Russian national security is an incredibly popular course. It's so popular that we worked it out that we can offer it two semesters in a row. I would put that first. That has the most weight. I want to make sure that I get that class. It's not a guarantee that I will, but it gives me the best chances. My first alternate request will be hands-on unconventional technologies. Why? Well, I know from talking to students or coming and talking to me or just kind of hearing chitter-chatter around the student lounge, I know that there are a lot of people who are probably interested in taking hands-on unconventional technologies. So, uh-oh. That was exciting. We'll just wait. We'll just cancel that. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why, no, no, okay. yeah. And then from current slide. I can't see. Oh. Do you mean help? Yeah, I can see. Like I know. Yikes. No worries. No, there we go. There we go. Okay, so I know that hands-on unconventional technologies is also going to be a fairly popular course. It has been. And it's also only taught in the fall semester. 
So I'll put that as my first alternate so that just in case I don't get Russian national security, I at least have a really good chance of getting hands on unconventional technologies. As my second primary course, and here's where the zigzag comes in, I put hands on unconventional technologies. Why? So if I get Russian national security, the system will ignore that first alternate and it's going to jump down to my second primary choice. You can see that I followed the pattern kind of along the way. My second alternate is economics of substate violence. Why would I do the second alternate and third primary choice? <clears throat> economics of substate violence, again, popular, but it's offered in both semesters. So it's offered in the fall and it's offered in the spring. So I know if I don't get it here, I do have another opportunity to get it, even if the spring semester is my last semester. I then put in security in South Asia as my third alternate and my fourth primary choice. And then just for fun, because I wanted to fill something in and Dr. McNair will get mad that I put it at the end, I put in his U.S. defense budget oh. class. His class is very popular. That's one of the things we can kind of talk about when we get to the question, like questions at the end, kind of a sense of kind of what are traditionally very uh, high demand courses. So now that I've prioritized my courses in my access, what's next? So you've put everything in and the grid and the columns look beautiful. You can go ahead and hit submit. When you hit submit, the system is actually really good about giving you any kind of warnings. Things like time conflicts, things like um, if you've requested a course in another department and it either has a prerequisite or it is a restricted course, so it's only for MSFS students or for PPAL students. This is when, uh, when you hit submit, you'll see those kinds of messages. It is important to pay attention to those because those can impact your pre-registration. So this is also a time when if you have a hold and you haven't been able to find it in student access or in my access and you haven't looked for it, you'll also get a message for every single course that you submit. If you have a hold, it says a student has a hold next to each course that you submit. Um, it is important if you request a course in another department, sometimes you get a chance to look through the schedule very closely and you can see it has a prerequisite or it's restricted to just the particular program. But if you don't happen to notice that, this is where that you'll be able to catch that. And if you put that course high in your priority list, you're not going to get it, okay? Because it's for other students. There is another way in which we can try and request the course for you, but there's no guarantee. I'll get to that at the end. So once you've submitted your prioritized requests, the requests end up in the SSP Academic Advisors course request approval queue. Long name basically a long page in my access and I can go through and see everything that you've requested. We review every single course request and we have to approve every single course request. So if you came to orientation or you've talked to me, you've talked to Bree, you know that we look at every single schedule during pre-registration. And so this is a time for us to check to make sure, are you on track? Are you heading towards graduation? Are the courses that you are requesting meeting those requirements and if we have questions we can get back in touch with you. Once we approve the requests they all land in the registrar's kind of like massive course cauldron. It's like this big thing and they dump everything in in one place and it kind of stir it up and that's how we get to things like that's where the algorithm comes in to play. If we have any questions, if I have any questions, any concerns about your course requests, or if I see a mistake, like if I see that there's a course conflict, I may send your requests back to you so that you can fix it, or at least make you aware, give you the opportunity to make a change. If I see you're in the second semester in your program, in the program, you haven't gotten your core concentration course in yet, I'll definitely send it back if I don't see that core concentration course as one of your requests. So there are opportunities to go in for us when we have questions to release the requests to you. But also, if you look through everything because you'll get a record and you think, I've made a mistake or I want to change something, you can come back and email me and say, hey, Amelia, can you send the requests back to me? This is possible before we approve your requests. 
after we approve the request and they've already been submitted to the registrar's office, I can't go back and get them. You can go to the registrar's office and ask them to release them. It takes about 48 to 72 hours sometimes for them to get back to you, but it is possible. But try as best as possible to like do it when I still have a hold of it. Um, just to give you a sense of time, like how quickly I go through things, the first 48 hours, I probably won't look at the, the queue at all, just to give everyone an opportunity to submit stuff. But after the first 48 hours, I'll start going through and approving everything. We have about 260 plus requests for students that we have to get through, and I'm going to be the one who will go through every single one. So it takes some time. The other thing is, the first day, it, the system's pretty full and pretty busy. It may take you some time to go through. The same thing is true when I'm going through and approving like the first 48 hours. It's pretty busy, so the system is pretty slow. So let's talk about how the courses are actually assigned by the registrar's office. The registrar has an algorithm which is run after all of the requests have been approved by the academic advisors to assign the available seats in courses. No joke, this algorithm has probably only been mildly tweaked in about 30 to 35 years that pre-registration has been in place here. It sticks to pretty much the same kind of schedule. There are a certain range of factors that are always considered. Course prioritization, how you've put things in order, your program or the registrar will call it major, so your program is SSP, and your level in the program. So course prioritization and program slash major are two of the most important factors. Why? Well, naturally, you put something first, hopefully that gives you the most weight, but the program piece is important because your first two courses in your major get the highest priority. So if you were to request um, Russian national security and an MSFS student were to request Russian national security because it's open to all GSFS students. You were to put it first, the MSFS person would put it first, you have the higher priority because it is in your program. The same holds true for your second priority course. After your second priority, third, fourth, the priority level drops down as you would expect and the weight of being an SSP drops down as well if you're requesting SSP courses, then you become as competitive as your other GSFS peers if you're requesting a course that's open to them. Level and program, that's a bigger deal at the undergraduate level when things are clearly defined. You're a freshman, you're a sophomore, you're a junior, you're a senior. At the graduate level, you'll see you're either a G1 or a K1 or a G23 or K23, it just kind of depends which part of my access you're looking at. So that comes kind of into play, but not as much at the graduate level. Time and date of submission do not factor into the registrar's algorithm because as long as you complete everything by the 16th, everyone will have equal time and date stamp priority. You must submit your requests by 11.59 p.m. on Saturday, April 16th to be included in the pre-registration round. This means actual submissions. If you've done pre-registration before, you know you can actually save your requests. <coughs> save the requests you don't make it. They have to be submitted. And do it by 11.59. And, and I have one favor to ask of all of you. Please, <laughs> just one. Try to get done by the 15th. The 15th is a Friday. The 16th is a Saturday. It's going, if you have problems with my access, if you have problems with a computer, if whatever, not many people are going to be around to help you. I'm not going to be around to help you and fix things for you uh, on that Saturday. So you need to get it done by the 15th. Just makes your life easier in case you run into any problems. So let's talk about important dates, and you can see I'm driving these dates home. Pre-registration opens on Monday, April 4th. It closes Saturday, April 16th at 11.59 p.m. Hard to say what time pre-registration opens on the 4th. 
some places I've seen nine o'clock, other times I know it'll open up right at midnight. It just kind of depends on who's setting the calendar. So you could be able to come in before nine o'clock and be able to get in even though it'll be posted. They're just trying to keep, it's just, it's hard to tell. Um, the pre-registration results will be available on Friday, April 29th. And you'll see I have little stars here. Sometimes, and if you pre-registered last semester or in prior semesters, you can go into My Access about 24 or 48 hours ahead of time, and sometimes you can see bits and pieces of your schedule. Um, those are not the official results. The official results really are the 29th, but honestly, there won't hopefully be that much difference than what you see 24 hours or 48 hours ahead of time and the 29th. But just be prepared. You might get to see a few things kind of earlier in the process. After pre-registration results are released, registration completion, that's the time where you can add and drop and waitlist courses. That'll run Tuesday, May 3rd through Thursday, May 5th. And that is when you can, again, you can add a course, you can drop a course, you can waitlist courses, and there will be course lotteries run during that period. And I'm pretty sure that they'll run them the third, the fourth, the fifth. There may not be one on the third, um, it just kind of depends on the timing, again, of the results and what they're able to run. For graduate students, even though course com the registration completion will close for undergraduates on the 5th, it will stay open for graduate students basically throughout the summer. So you can go in, you can tinker, you can look at your schedule, and then the next course lottery for the fall semester will be run the day before the first day of classes, which will be Tuesday, August 30th. So the thing is to remember, ask the right people the right questions. So you may hear chitter chatter, you may hear bits and pieces of information, how you should prioritize, what you should do, what's going to be popular. Remember, there are a lot of us down in the downstairs who do registration, who've been through registration before, feel like you can come and ask us those questions. You don't have to just rely on your peers, and so we're here to help you. And so I encourage you, while it may be a busy time, shoot me an email. You know, schedule an appointment. We've got course, we've got um, advising appointments that are short, that are about 20 minutes. Even if you want to come in with your list of courses and say, Amelia, how would I prioritize these things? I feel like you can come and do that. I'm happy to spend the time to help you get like the best opportunities possible to get the courses that you want. Okay, so that was the main portion of the presentation. Let me give you kind of some bits and pieces and facts that just are too jumbled to be on a slide. Some of you are interested in language courses. Uh, language courses you can pre-register for. I recommend that if you're going to do that, put them lower in terms of the priority. They don't count towards your degree. I mean, unless there's really a professor you really, really want, Remember, before I said your top two choices are really for the courses that you really, really, really want and the priority comes within your major. The language course, it's going to be easier for you if you don't get it through pre-registration. There's more flexibility in add drop. So that's one thing to think about in terms of language for the upcoming semester. If you find a course that is not on our pre-approved course list that is outside of SSP, you can pre-register for the course. I don't have a problem if you do that. But at the same time, please submit course approval requests to Dr. McNower. He will go through, he'll see if there's an available, you know, if there's an available syllabus, he can go through, figure out what it can count towards, if it's something different than what you have requested. But it's easier to get that done now than do it and have me come back and say, you know, I haven't seen a course request for you, and then have to hold up your, your pre-registration. The other important thing to remember is that in no phase of registration, be it pre-registration, add drop, you know, your current enrollment, you cannot carry a time conflict at all. If it's a language course versus whatever, you can't do that. And the system will not allow you, and the registrar will not allow any exceptions to that. There have been students in the past who've run into, I have a class from 4 to 6.30, and then I want to take a class from 6.30 to 9. That's not a conflict. I mean, I can just miss a couple minutes. We've asked before. Dave and I have talked about it. We've talked to the registrar. Their answer is no. That is considered a time conflict because in the system, it's 4 to 6.30 and 
6.30 to 9. And while we would love some flexibility, we're kind of driven by those rules. And, and don't go ask the professors if they'll let you out earlier or let you in late. Yeah. In there because they, they can't. Yeah. I mean, it, whatever they say isn't going to impact on right. the registration process. And, and the same holds true, I mean, really holds true for a true conflict. Like, if you have a class that you're really interested in, don't go to the, like, don't go to the other professor, like if it's a language class and it conflicts with an SSP class or a class outside of SSP, don't go to the class that you think, to the professor who you think will be the most flexible and say, can I do this? And the professor, of course, will say, oh, sure, I don't have, really have a problem with that. But the problem is the professor may not, but the actual administrators and the system do have problems with that. So we can't, you just can't work around that at all. So. Now is the time for you all to ask questions, because I know I've bombarded you with a bunch of information. Yes? I was just wondering <clears throat> whether you could give us maybe a raw rundown of like what the maybe four to five most popular courses usually are. Sure, that's actually, so it does vary, it's a great question, and it does vary from semester to semester. In the fall semester, I would say, um, not in any particular order, but just to keep in mind. I know that Russian national security will be very popular this semester. Uh, disruptive analytics is kind of a perennial favorite. Um, economics of substate violence. I know that Dr. Arsenault is teaching terrorism and counterterrorism. I know that that is going to be a high demand course. Um, Hands on unconventional technologies. I've just heard a lot of people who are really interested in taking it, and it is only offered in the fall semester. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else would be. Uh, Sasha's other intelligence uh, uh, analysis it's, course, now he's teaching both Russian and intelligence in the, in the fall for the first time. Yeah. And that's been popular. He hadn't taught it since a spring a year ago. So. Yeah. yeah. That was popular, very popular. Um, and then the two other courses would be violent non-state actors, mm -hmm. and then um, Trita Parsi's course. Um, U.S. Uh, I, I never get it right. Um, politics. Politics. Yeah. Power of politics in the yeah. Middle East. There we go. And Ken Pollock's course. Uh, military, military. So oh, yeah. military analysis. So Professor Pollock does teach a military analysis course for us in the fall, and then he teaches warfare in the Middle East in the spring. The military analysis course is very interesting, and it kind of is cyclical. Some fall semesters, because he only teaches in fall, it's incredibly popular. Some, you know, there's some flexibility, and, and students can get space. But a lot of students end up either taking him for warfare in the Middle East and love taking his class, and so want to take it, and take the military analysis class. Others are just kind of like, I've done one, or I'm really waiting for warfare in the Middle East. One last course that is actually pretty popular, and we've restricted it for the first time, um, is Dr. Stanley's Mind Fitness class. We've restricted it to SSP students only. There are 14 seats in that class, as opposed to 18. So, uh, an important thing to keep in mind, though, is I, I touched on this briefly before. Um, courses like disruptive analytics, economics of substate violence, uh, even um, like covert action and counterintelligence, comparing intelligence services. Those are courses that are taught in each semester. And so sometimes that can help with your like long range planning. Like you can say, okay, if I, if I don't get economics of substate violence this semester, I can take it in the spring. The other thing that's good in prioritizing, and Bree taught me this, this was not one I had kind of thought of, of myself. If there are two requirement courses that you'd be satisfied with, again, I'll go back to econ, um, like Dr. McNower's defense budgeting and economics of war. You can actually put those on the same line, like you could put those at your second, you know, first primary and first alternate, or second primary and second alternate, if you would be happy with either course. Because again, if you don't get one and you'll get the other, you potentially get the other, that's another way to kind of do some strategic planning. Yeah? Is Russian national security taught in spring semester as well, or just this? So, we, haven't, we, we, haven't. we won't do spring planning until, um, until no, August, August. And, uh, and have that finalized. But, um, I, and I can't guarantee this because uh, the professors you know, have their, their uh, priorities and preferences, but I'm pretty confident that uh, Professor Mansaroff will, will probably teach both courses in the spring. Uh, I know he likes all of our students, uh, has a great, you know, and, and his 
course is in high demand. So I think uh, you know my conversations with him, unless he has other outside uh, commitments, that he'll probably teach both the Russian National Security and the Intelligence course next spring as well. But we won't be able to confirm that until uh, we go through spring course planning in August and September. Is it helpful, I mean, at all for you to understand, like our timeline for course planning is slightly drawn out. I mean, sometimes we're starting to do planning for the next semester before the semester begins. So like we'll start talking about spring and August before you all have even come back for classes. And so while we anticipate as best as possible what will be taught and what we hope will be taught, again, if things can change. We can even start off with an initial schedule and have courses drop off along the way. And just so you know, we plan the spring semester in August and September. Uh, in October, we plan the summer semester. And in January and February, we plan the fall semester. Uh, and it's like a three-dimensional chessboard because we have to go to each professor. Uh, they have to, we have to confirm their schedules, what day of the week. Uh, we have to negotiate because we try to make sure we have the right distribution of courses over the four days and the distribution between 6.30 and 5 o'clock courses. Uh, and so it's a three-dimensional chessboard and a lot of coordination and negotiation. Uh, and of course, new courses, we listen to input at the town hall and, and things. We get a lot of input from employers uh, and of course we get approaches uh, from uh, uh, you know, distinguished practitioners uh, who have courses to, uh, to offer. And so we, you know, it, it's, a, it's a complex process. One of the things to keep in mind, uh, some of those courses that, that Nelia showed at the beginning won't have the professors listed on there. If they're a new professor, uh, it, it's another complex process and it has to go through uh, a process all the way to the provost uh, and you know our needs and uh, and timelines uh, don't match the higher level of of the uh, uh, of the organization. They don't think that anyone needs to be hired until right before the fall semester, uh, which of course complicates things for the professor setting up Blackboard, having access, and having their name on the course when they register. Uh, so you might not see all of their names now. Right. Professor Tomes, you will. Uh, Professor Lynch, Professor yeah, Harold, because they are already. Yeah. Uh, they've already taught here, but a, a new professor, um, you know, you need to do the research uh, about the professor and, and understand they will be the professor, uh, but, you know, our bureaucratic processes don't always match up uh, for timing. But we do our best, um, both Andrea and Olivia, you know, have relationships with all of the faculty members. We really do our best to get um, syllabi, course descriptions up as quickly as possible. Um, and if it's a new course to try and get course designations, we've really been working with Dr. McNower to get those available as quickly as possible for you all to be able to access. And so while the professor, when you look at the course set schedule, may say TBA, if you click on the course description, uh, you'll be able to hopefully find a syllabus and the professor will be listed there and you can read through. And if you have any questions, like it says TBA, but it says here it's Professor Lynch, or it says here that it's, you know, Go ahead and ask the question, and we can confirm with you. That's not a problem. Yeah. For those of us taking the seminar next uh, semester, yeah. how do you suggest we go about selecting a uh, question? How to select? You know, that's a really interesting question, and I will say that you, that the research seminar is probably the piece that is the most personal because all of you really have different desires for your thesis. Some of you will just say, you're like, get her done. I'm going to you know, crank out the 10,000 words, turn it in, and be happy to have it done. Some of you want to write your research seminar, build it out, maybe have it as a piece for publication at some point in time. Maybe some of you want to have it be a piece for future employment that you want to be able to use. Maybe you're thinking some way down the road, or maybe not so far away, you want to go in for a PhD. And so is this a topic that you want to build from? I think sometimes people assume they should select a professor who is in the area of expertise in which you're planning on writing your paper. Sometimes that can work, but sometimes it's actually more helpful to have someone who doesn't know because that's the person who can go in and, and go pretty deep with you and say, I have a question about this, or have you thought about that? And it really makes you actually process and analyze a lot more about your research, 
what you want to do. Maybe it helps you broaden the way you look at your topic. Whereas if you're with a subject matter expert, that's great because that's a person who can point you in the exact direction that you need to go to find the information. But maybe because the person knows so much, may not necessarily agree with the approach that you are taking for your paper. So I think that there are a lot of pieces that kind of go into play. Um, I know GSSR has been working on interviews with all of the 710 professors for the fall semester to kind of give you a background on their research interests, um, what their approaches are, uh, and that should help. If there is a professor in particular that you want, um, you know, check with me and I can kind of give you a sense in terms of popularity. I know that Dr. Tabatabai will be teaching in terms of core faculty members. Um, Professor Schultz will be teaching. So we can talk about like how you put that in with your other courses. I think it really depends on what really is the priority as well with your other courses. Does that kind of help answer yeah. your question? Let me, let me add a couple things. We will have 710, there will be enough room for all of you who are, uh, who are graduating in the fall. There'll be enough professors and, and seats in those sections. Uh, but as Neely has said, you know, you've got to prioritize, is there a certain professor you want or is your priority on a certain day of the week? Uh, and, and so you've got to, and then of course, is your priority that course or section on that day or another course uh, that you still have to meet a requirement? So you've got to prioritize and, and as Nelia emphasizes, think strategically. Uh, but you will get into 710 uh, at some time uh, because there will be enough seats. You know, other courses obviously you're competing for, uh, but you know, it, to get into 710 it may impact your other course requests uh, because of those timing conflicts. And, uh, and, but you've got to decide what your priorities are, the professor, the day and time, uh, or your other, uh, your other courses that you have, other classes that you have to take. I do think that those GSSR interviews will be extremely helpful. Also look at the syllabi. Well, we've gone through and we've standardized the length and the due dates for the 710 for the research papers. Each professor does approach research and research questions very differently. And so it's worth reading through those. That's the one place for, even though it's the same course, same number, we still allow professors to kind of have some creativity and individuality within it within certain confines to make sure you all are turning in a 40-page paper on the same day so that there isn't inequity in those areas. Um, while we're talking about kind of priorities and, and 710 and stuff like that, let me throw a couple, as we say at my house, bubble smashers in the way. So I know for some people who are graduating in the fall, they were maybe hoping that either General Dubik or Dr. Arsenault would be teaching 710. Sadly, they are not. We need them to be teaching other things. Um, and also, some of you have asked about Secretary Albright's America's National Security Toolbox, which is generally she teaches it in the fall for graduate students. I have not seen it on the schedule yet. No, she's not teaching in the fall. She is That's, not teaching in the fall. She's not, she's not teaching at all. So for those of you who may have been holding out for that course, I'm sorry, she's not. So, um, and it doesn't look like there's going to be any kind of replacement for that course. And of so, course, that's open to all of SFS. All, and that's, all that's GSFS. Very competitive on it's, yeah, and it's, it's done in a very different way. Do we know if she's coming back for the spring? I, I believe so, but I'm not sure if it'll be undergraduate or graduate. Or graduate. So, yeah. so we'll just, if, for those of you who may be interested, we'll just have to see if she comes back in the spring, if she ends up picking up and doing a graduate level. I, traditionally in the spring semesters when she'll teach it to the undergraduates. Of course, that's always subject to change as well. And you know, the schedule is subject to change. So I mean, with people of her stature, you yeah. know, that's... Uh, Go ahead. Are there any courses that have fallen off the master list that are just not, like, that were taught, but have been dropped from the course? Mm, not ones that that have been taught really in the past, I'd say, four or five years. That we've actually kept, the registrar requires that you keep numbers for certain courses in a kind of a five-year cycle so that it gives students enough time to complete degrees. Like certain students come in in 2012 and don't finish until the spring of 2017 for a variety of reasons. 
leaves of absence, that kind of stuff. And so we have to keep certain courses alive for at least five years. So no, the master course list has stuff that goes back to, that would be fall of 2011. What else? Any specific scare? There are no, like, and which is always kind of my rule here, no silly questions, no stupid questions. Everything's just a good question. Yes. So, so I don't have a question because hopefully I'm going to graduate. But, um, <laughs> I will graduate. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but my my the one thing I wanted to point out was when um, you're doing your prioritization, it's important to make sure your your days aren't overlapping. So if you prioritize like a Monday class on the first one, and your next and you know you're hoping that you'll get it, but if not, you'll get um, your your second priority number one is going to be um, another Monday class. If you do get into the first say like priority one class, it's going to skip over any time conflicts to go down. So yeah. that's something you have to be careful about. And that's, he jumped absolutely right. And she's, she's an expert as well. She, how many times have you done this? Like way more times than probably any of us want to count. <laughs> but it's true. So if you have your second, second priority course is a, Monday, is a Monday class and your first priority course is a Monday class and you get into that first priority class, it's going to ignore your second priority. So, so be pretty mindful of the days of the week. So in light of that, would you recommend not take like not having as your first alternate your con core concentration class? So you can't really plan to have on two separate days of the week if you don't get into one. That's a good question. I'm trying to think of how I would do that. Um, of course, we'll have U.S. national and international security two sections. So there'll be, be two different. Oh, inter uh, international security always has two sections. Uh, Terrorism, counterterrorism always has two sections. So if right. there's one that fits. But it, if you prioritize every other class that you want to take based on one, and then you have, you should probably have as your alternate because you have to take it if it's in the second semester. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend balancing that? Well, your core courses should be your priority. Yeah, right. no, no, but I know exactly what you're saying. Like, if, if you build everything around terrorism, counterterrorism, and it's Monday at 5 to 7.30, but the other section is Tuesday, 6.30 to 9, you know, what do you do? And you need three classes. How do you put that in? Uh, I have a suggestion for that. I love that. Um, <laughs> so what you do is you, you take your line. So if you're priority number one, alter, primary and alternate, you put, you know, say the Monday class, that you want is the Monday of class is the one that you want first. So you put that as your primary, and then you do the second second section as your alternate. Either way, you're going to get one of those. Um, so you don't base. So then, what you do is, so if it's a Monday and a Tuesday, then you have to be careful about the next priorities that you pick that are not there. Just have to be Wednesday, Thursday classes. Yeah. But that and that and yeah, I mean that makes it a little challenging to be able to get sometimes three classes that way. So it, so it is, it's not, I mean, and unfortunately, I, I mean, I can't tell you absolutely, like, if you put terrorism, counterterrorism with Dr. Arsenault, are you going to get it first? I, I mean, if you put it as your first priority, are you definitely going to get it? I mean, my hope would be yes, but, I mean, there is, there is a lot of hope, there's a lot of kind of registration karma that goes into this, um, and so it is, it's hard to know, because it can... It can completely throw off your schedule. I understand what you're saying, and, it, and it's tough for me to say to you, like, he just suggested is probably the best to put your your two core, the two sections of the core courses, your one primary, one alternate, and then build around kind of the courses that don't conflict with it. When you said that priority is given based on program or majors, is that just uh, between like MSFS and SSP, or is it? within SSP concentrations will be given higher priority to things. So that's a great question because I know a lot of you will ask like, well I'm a terrorism, I'm a TSV concentrator, don't I get priority? No. The system, this is the hard part, we can keep track of it and it's really an, a, an internal system to us. The registrar system is not robust enough to support our concentrations. The coding can't, so it, it, there's no way to go in and give you a concentration in the registrar system. I mean, I know that that's not what you want to hear. Like, you'd like to think that you have some priority, but we've tried and we've asked, and there's just no way to, 
to do that. The system just can't handle it. It can handle it for the undergraduates, not at the graduate level. There are too many programs. Well, believe me, Amelia has brought this up at, at the, the meetings, and you know we requested this. I mean, we we want to do that, but we've talked about it because we know we do make that requirement for you that you have to take it by the, your second semester in the program, and there's just no way for us to control it. That's also, for those of you who are getting closer to graduation and you think, oh, I see in my access there's the degree audit feature, don't check that. It doesn't, because you'll go in and you'll send me an email that says, and that's like a heart attack email, like, oh my god, really, like, it doesn't say that this, and I, and I go, we keep track of it. We actually have a CRM, and I go in each semester, and I put in all of your courses and how they count. And that's why, again, when I talked earlier about how Bree and I, since you all have been with us, but you know, going forward, we touch every single request that you make and every single course that you take, and we make sure, does it double count?